things were not good for the people of God, for the Israelites back in the land of Egypt. Moses had escaped into his self-imposed exile after killing one of their taskmasters, but his people were still trapped in their slavery. They were brought low, they were pressed down, they were suffering. And from down below, the Israelites cried out to God, and we read their cry for help rose up to God. Perhaps they wondered if there really was anyone there listening to their cry. However, the faith portrayed in this biblical text tells the story with conviction that every cry with the suffering it expresses is falling not on deaf ears, but on the heart of God. If God is hidden, God is hidden within the suffering. God heard the cry of the people and God remembered having made certain promises to them. Something had to be done. We know from our passage last week about a baby drawn up from the waters, that a plan had, in a sense, already been put in place, even before God remembered or God took notice of his people and their suffering. Nevertheless, I think it is significant that the slaves, not God, were the ones who provided the initial motivation for the Exodus confrontation. Their cry for help is characteristic of Israel's powerful tradition of lament. And that we, as part of that tradition, we should not be embarrassed or hesitant to cry out to God in our need, in our suffering, and ask for help. It seems fair to say then that the plan that was in place got kicked into motion by a relational interpersonal move by Israel, by them crying out from their hearts to a God who they believed or who they hoped must be there, must be there listening, a God who cares, and therefore a God who will respond, a God who will do something about their situation. Meanwhile, Moses was minding his own business, or perhaps he was minding someone else's business because that's what his father-in-law's sheep would have been. He was out doing the regular things that ordinary people do. He was taking care of business, and in that situation, tending a flock of sheep. Perhaps Moses thought that he had things in rather good order for a man on the run, a man wanted by the powers that be in Egypt for murder. In chapter 2, Moses calls himself an alien residing in a foreign land. But he is a man who has never really been at home anywhere, raised by a Hebrew mother, adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter and given an Egyptian name. And although he tries to intervene to help his kinfolk, the Hebrews, he ends up murdering an Egyptian, his adopted people, and being rejected by his own. He flees Egypt and the mess that he has created there only to be identified as an Egyptian by the women at the well in Midian. He is from, or rather he is the adopted son of royalty, and yet now Moses is here in the wilderness shepherding flocks in the Sinai Peninsula. It would have been very hot. The air would have felt thick and the horizon would have shimmered. It would have been easy to see mirages and other apparitions in the desert. So when Moses suddenly came upon an angel of the Lord and a bush on fire, he may not have trusted his own eyes. When Moses saw that the bush was burning, but not being consumed, his curiosity was piqued. He needed to know more. He needed to take a closer look. And so he took the time to go and look at this wondrous sight. Now, most of you will know that the burning bush is the symbol of the Presbyterian Church in Canada and the symbol of what could be considered our mother church, the Church of Scotland. And on your screen right now, you'll see the current, um, the current logo of the burning bush that the Presbyterian Church in Canada uses. We also have a burning bush on our wall here in our sanctuary above the pulpit. It also has the Latin phrase underneath, Nectamen consumabitur, which is translated as, it was not, however, consumed. I will come back to this interesting choice in a little bit. 
So Moses approached this burning bush, and when God saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. This is perhaps a small point, but when God sets a bush ablaze, he didn't choose a bush that was right in front of Moses that he would have stumbled over. God instead chose one that was within sight, but well away from him. Moses would have had to go out of his way to explore it. And he did. And it was this curiosity that brought Moses to this wondrously burning bush, which turned out to be so much more. The mission field, the place and the work that God is calling us to, it isn't always right in front of us. It isn't always easy to see. Sometimes it's happening off in the periphery. And we need to, to just catch that glimpse of it and have our interest peaked and we need to go closer and learn more about it. We need to follow our instincts off the path to get that closer look and perhaps, perhaps we just might hear the voice of God when we do so. In ministry, we are called often enough to look more closely, to listen more intently to search out the nooks and the crannies of the world around us and hear the cry of the people that we might not normally hear. And then, set on fire, we do what God does. We do what God asks us to do. And sometimes God comes to us even when we feel far away, when we are on the run, figuratively and literally, when we are basically hiding from God or from other people in some kind of place precisely because it seems so isolated. And yet it is in these lonely places that God often finds us, that God catches us, that God calls us out. God, however, never just delivers us from something. God always delivers us to something. God promises to deliver Israel from Egyptian slavery to the spacious, fertile ground that God has promised to the children of Abraham. God's plan for Israel's liberation probably sounds pretty good to Moses until God begins to fill in the details. After all, God tells him, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Israel or out of Egypt. And it's as if Moses squawks, are you kidding, God? You want me to stand in front of Pharaoh? As one biblical scholar notes, Moses turns, here I am, into who am I? His readiness turns into resistance. Yet Moses isn't just a messenger. He's also the one with whom God promises to stand before the rebellious Pharaoh. And as it turns out, the rebellious Israel the divine eye will go with the human eye to accomplish God's plan. A reminder that we do not go alone. Yet not even God's promise to go with Moses is enough to convince him as Moses, who am I, then turns into, who are you? If he's to take this risky job, then Moses wants to know just who this God is who promises to accompany him on this mission, on this journey. And God, God's answer to that question is one of the most mysterious in the whole Bible. The New Revised Standard Version, which I read from this morning, it translates, translates it as, I am who I am. Now, I personally like this paraphrase, I will be who I am and I am who I will be. Yet no matter how we translate God's answer to Moses' question about God's identity, it's an answer that reflects God's faithfulness, faithfulness to both himself and God's character. God insists that Moses and Israel can count on God to always be who God is, that is, among other things, faithful. That's, in fact, why God both hears Israel's groaning and is concerned about Israel. God is what God is, faithful. That's why God will rescue Israel from her slavery. God is what God is, faithful. That's why God will plant the freed Israel in the land that God promised to their ancestor Abraham. God is what God is, faithful. 
Yet how do God's adopted sons and daughters know that God cares about the cries of the hungry, the sad, the fearful, and the oppressed? How do we know that God cares about a world turned upside down from COVID-19, or people affected by natural disasters like hurricanes or wildfires, or racialized violence and the protests against it, or people with cancer and their families? How do we know? God, after all, sometimes seems to wait a long time to answer our cries. Sometimes, in fact, God even seems to answer our cries with a no. So how do God's people know that God cares so deeply for us? The answer, the answer is Jesus Christ, whom God faithfully sent to live, die, and rise again from the dead. God sent him to free us from all the things that enslave us, including sin, Satan, and death. So Jesus Christ is God's answer to all of our cries, just as Moses was the answer to the Israelites' cries in Egypt. God, in fact, cares not just about those who suffer, but even about those who inflict the suffering. After all, Christ came to reconcile all things to himself. So he's God's sign that God hears not just the cries of the oppressed, but also the cries of the needy oppressors. God hears the cries of oppression, grief, fear, or doubt, because God is faithful. God's people can walk into whatever thing is new this week, this month, or this school year, whatever it has in store for us, because God is faithful. We can look forward to a home in God's presence in this new creation, because God is faithful. We are quick to sing choruses of hymns like, Here I am, Lord, it is I, Lord. I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. But just like Moses, we are not always so quick to respond when we hear what God wants us to do. Coming up with a long list of excuses and a long list of assurances that we need from God. What task might God have set for us? What mission are we called to? What path have we been set upon, both as individuals and as a congregation, as a member of the ministerial, of the, the, the group of churches here in our community, as a denomination? The truth is, is that most of us don't see ourselves as the stuff of which faith heroes are made. But that's probably because we haven't really been reading our Bibles very carefully. After all, very few of the characters God uses, including Moses, are the stuff of heroes. And yet God uses these frail, fallible, and oh-so-ordinary people over and over to do extraordinary things. Martin Buber, the famous 20th century Jewish philosopher said, it is laid upon the stammering to bring the voice of heaven to earth. And friends, when God asks us to do something, we come from a long line of stammerers. But we might also consider the terrible alternative, living a life with no sense of call. For we could refuse to listen, refuse to go up to that mountaintop, to close ourselves off from the holiness of God, that, the divinity that pursues us and calls out our names. I mean, life is certainly simpler that way, and we are certainly free to say no. Walter Brueggemann describes the uncalled life as an autonomous existence in which there is no intrusion, disruption, or redefinition no appearance or utterance of the holy. Our culture tells us that we should be independent and self-sufficient. We just have to make it on our own. But Brueggemann thinks that we are only fooling ourselves, for like Moses, we are not autonomous. There is the one who knows and calls by name, even while we imagine we are unknown and unsummoned. I would add, even unlistened to. In the end, the question then is whether we'll actually have the courage to listen and respond, trusting that wherever we go, to Egypt, to Pharaoh, to the ends of the earth, 
we will never be alone, that God indeed is faithful. John Calvin, in many ways, the founder of the Reformed Church, which includes the Presbyterian Church, had observed that the burning bush is present throughout the ages. The church is continually subject to, in Calvin's words, the fire of persecution. Yet in keeping with Christ's promise, it is ever kept from being consumed to ashes, sustained not by its own strength, but by the presence of God in its midst. The burning bush was chosen as a symbol of many reformed denominations, including Presbyterians, because of Calvin's words. And the symbol of the burning bush resonated with their experience of persecution and God's call on their lives despite it. In some ways, it has come full circle as we struggle in these increasingly secular times to keep the church from being consumed and turned into ash. And I know that many are fearful that the church will never be the same after COVID. And that might well be true, but it will not be consumed because God is faithful. God is calling you and I to something today, just as he called Moses to free the Israelites from Egypt. Quiet yourself for a moment, listen. Do you hear him speaking? What's he saying? If you actually acted on that, would it be a little scary? Probably. But you hear what else he's saying? I am who I am. I will be with you. Amen. Our next piece of music is called Do Not Be Afraid. It was uh, recorded for the 2020 Choral Camp put on by Agilum Camps. Jim Breen of Hope United in Alvinston and his family have been part of this camp for a long time. During this time of COVID, it is a virtual recording, but I thought the words were apt for our message this Sunday, and it involves some local people that many of us know. Let these words flow over you. Do not be afraid. (laughs) 